Welcome to this inaugural webinar of the Asia-Pacific Network of Healthcare Service Regulators. My name is John Lim, and I am Professor and Executive Director of the Center of Regulatory Excellence, or CORE, at the Duke National University of Singapore Medical School, or Duke NUS in Singapore. The APAC webinar series is one of the ongoing activities of the APAC Network of Healthcare Service Regulators, which is supported by Duke NUS Corps in partnership with Singapore's Ministry of Health. This network was initiated by the Singapore Ministry of Health in June 2022 to provide a platform for individual economies from across the Asia Pacific region to share experiences and best practices in topics related to health services regulation. The aim is to learn from experiences and encourage regulatory collaboration among regional health services regulators by focusing on local and regional issues of relevance and value. The network has already had several knowledge sharing meetings attended by 10 economies since October 2022. The new APAC webinar network series will feature key global experts sharing their knowledge and experience on topics of interest for members of the network. We hope to provide participants with fresh opportunities to benefit from our experts' viewpoints to help address key and emerging healthcare issues in your policy and operational work. Today's topic is one of particular interest and significance to all of us as we increasingly grapple with health systems issues related to aging. I'm delighted that we can launch this series with our first distinguished expert, Dr. Louise Lafortune, who will be speaking to us today on aging well in the community, the social value of community-based interventions. Dr. Lafortune is Principal Research Associate and Lead of Life Course and Aging Research at the Cambridge Public Health Interdisciplinary Research Center in the United Kingdom. She's also Principal Investigator for the UK National Institute of Health Research, a school for public health research, and a research program on the social return on investment of age-friendly communities. She co-leads the Population Evidence and Data Science theme for the Applied Research Collaboration in the East of England and serves on the WHO Technical Advisory Group for Measurement, Monitoring and Evaluation of the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. Louise chaired the Aging Longevity and Health Initiative at the International Alliance of Research Universities and has served on research and policy advisory boards, including NICE, the Alzheimer's Society, and Public Health England. Louise holds a Master of Neurosciences from McGill University in Canada and a dual PhD in Public Health from Université de Montréal and Université de Paris. Her background includes eight years of industry engagement in health economics and outcomes research and 14 more in policy-oriented public health and aging research. Today, Louise will be sharing her insights on community-based interventions for the aging population and their resource and regulatory implications. This relates to her ongoing work on the social return on investment of age-friendly communities and asset-based models to foster aging well in the community. Louise believes older people should be able to live full, engaged lives in their chosen communities, and her work targets systems, policies, and technologies that help people maintain their independence and quality of life as they age. I trust that what you hear today will not only provide you with useful insights, but also inspire you in your work. There will be an opportunity in the last 15 minutes or so for you to pose your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And I think I've spoken enough, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand the time over to Dr. Louise Lafortune. Louise, over to you, please. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, okay. Um, this opportunity, this invitation for the webinar, I'm delighted to be here to present what I hope, uh, as we've just heard, uh, will be a, a discussion and an idea generating uh, conversation on the importance of community-based interventions to foster aging well in the community. So I have a lot to say and I will uh, make sure I stick to time so I'll get right onto it. But first I would like to acknowledge just right, um, 
the funder, so I'm a public health researcher funded by public funds in the UK by the National Institute of Health Research and just want to acknowledge uh, the work of the team and also the stakeholders and a lot of older adults who supported our work uh, over the years and uh, this saw some of the details of the funders for my uh, for the work. So what is aging? Uh, we can start with population with demographic aging. And most of you will be familiar with this visual representation of the population pyramid, which really makes it possible to visualize and to understand the enormous global transformation. So demographic aging, as some of you will know, I won't give you a, a lecture just to uh, introduce the topic, is really the process of popu a population becoming older over, over time. And it occurs when the proportion of older adults, typically age 65 or more, increase while the proportion of younger individual decreases. So when we look at that pyramid uh, from the 1950s, you could see at the base, there's a really high childbirth with a lot of child mortality and more mortality as people get older. So you can see on the left hand side, you have the age, different age group and different colors rep represent a shift in the structure of the population pyramid over the years. Everything in yellow are projections. So since the 19, since about 2018, there's been a, a, a significant shift again in, in lower child mortality and people are living longer lives. And we expect that by 2100, there will be again, no widening of the pyramid, meaning very low child mortality but more and more people living to later life, and the squaring of the pyramid in the term we hear. So here what we have is just a, a, a snapshot really taken from the United Nations latest statistics on global aging trends, and it shows the median age um, of human countries. So the median is really dividing the population in two part, into equal size. And what you see in the darker red shaded areas is where the ratio of older to younger population is much higher. And the trends is very different uh, across the world, as, as you will know. So here, if we focus on Asia, you could see it's the same data really, just presented visually and in a different way, where you could see the median age moving from 1950 and much later on for Asia. And when we break it down by different countries, I chose just a few of them uh, only because otherwise the, the screen is not really visible. You can see that there's a major uh, shift and there's an upward trend that we're uh, seeing in most countries with China, Japan, Singapore being a bit higher up in that already um, aging uh, demographic shift. So now the question was, is, is why is this important? The fact that we're older, it doesn't matter really. Um, but what it is really, and there's a lot written about this, and it's an interesting concept, is that the demographic shift is linked with an epidemiologic transition. So the health of older people is a public health concern due to the change in the distribution of the cause of morbidity and mortality. And from a health system perspective, this is often what um, the focus is on. So there's a number of policies, demographic policies around fertility and and um, migration but the focus for today's conversation is really say what about the health of older people how can we maintain the health of older populations in a way that can foster um, engagement in active life but also shift the thinking on being old being a problem or challenge for society but really right the benefit of this progression that has been driven by better health conditions better healthcare systems overall so there's a real opportunity uh, for different systems to actually think about how we deal with it so now obviously and i won't go in the knot of details on this but there are the, the health related issues for aging populations are well documented there are all these clinical issues, and I won't read all the slides, it's just put some uh, indications of what the implications are uh, around the need for more medical care, for more support. Um, there are also ethical issues around healthcare, there are broad social and policy implications as well, and the financial consequences. But the crucial question when you think of demographic aging like that is, is increased life expectancy associated with increased time in ill health or not? Now, 
I've summarized in three bullet points, maybe not doing justice to all the thinking and the data behind these three, but there are three core models really that we can think of. So the expansion of morbidity, where people live longer in poorer health, and there's evidence that in some countries, including in the United States, that this is what's happening. So, so people live longer, but the time at which health problems start kicking in, in terms of creating disability requirements for healthcare support and healthcare system is not moving. The second scenario that, that what they call dynamic equilibrium, the only thing it means is that we can live longer, but we can also, with all the support and the current um, health and social support that we can provide, shift disability. But overall, we spend, on average, the same amount of time in poor health. The best scenario and the scenario that we're aiming for is really one where there would be a compression of morbidity. So looking at the health states of people today or the health states of people 10 years ago, how can we make sure that all the activities and the investment will promote healthier for longer and decrease the time people spend in poor health? And one approach to this, and this is the, 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 the focus of today, is that we need a core preventive approach. We need to ask at different, uh, to work at different level, but with primary prevention, so stopping the problems from occurring in the first place, and what we call in public health secondary prevention, so mitigating the risk of complications and controlling the conditions that already happen in groups of people. Um, the population, the health of overall population, as you know, is dynamic. So there's some things that have happened already. And there's a whole cohort of people who already have chronic conditions, but they are things that can do in the community and at the system level to mitigate those risks. At the same time as looking at the younger old and the younger population already in midlife to say, what are the things we need to do now to mitigate the risk of all the environmental factors that we're talking about? So the idea is to not to think about, so, so we have those major trends, the demographic trends, and we know that chronological aging is just the passing of time. But the impact of the aging population when we try to look at what can we do to people is really the change that occurs at both the molecular, cellular, physiological level. And, and, and all of you know that. And that impacts our organs. A lot of the investment when a, from a health system or even more from a health care system point of view has been focused on these more individual level, like intra-body uh, um, factors, not only, uh, but uh, quite a lot of it. But when we think about healthy aging in communities and at scale, what drives healthy aging at the population level and in communities is a whole range of socioeconomic determinants. And these determinants are often not completely addressed or are we're starting to understand more and more how they work. So we have the age and the sex and the const constitutional factors of the body. There's the behaviors and the different lifestyles that people adopt, whether or not it's their choice depends on a lot of the social and community environments and the networks but also the cultural and the physical and economic environments in which they live. So we think about individual lifestyle factors and people's behavior. A lot of people don't have the choice about many of what many of the behaviors they have. There are barriers to engaging in physical activities. There are major barriers for people to access good, healthy, nutritious foods. And these are all things that can be acted upon. So these are determinants. But when we think of these determinants, not just at one point in time, but if we look from a life course perspective where we can act at different time for, in different time frames for different cohorts or groups or generations, whatever we want to break it, is that these factors accumulate over time. They are independent, cumulative, and they interact. So it is a complex system of risk factors. So Thinking about intervention as one intervention per factor becomes quite overwhelming because what do we do for work environment, water? We can't, we can have individual interventions, but the trick is really to bring a lot of these interventions together in a system that fosters healthy behaviors. So 
I won't read this page because you know all of this, but what I'm trying to come to, to, to communicate here is that these social determinants impact on many different dimensions. So different people will have an idea of what it is that we're trying to measure. Do we want to prevent heart problems if you take a medical perspective? Or do we want to decline mobility and independence or dementia? What, is less, what has been less studied and addressed from a health systems point of view is the right side of this, flat, this side around the social isolation, the grief, the caring responsibilities, the financial challenges, which are not independent. They come with a lot of the problems that can develop as people age. And this, is, this sounds like an obvious comment, but when we looked at systems level, it's the ability to juggle these different concepts when we think about the interventions and how we invest in places and the communities. So the framing for the rest of the talk and in the sense that the rationale and the argument for focusing on communities is what people call home. We often hear about people wanting to live at home. Uh, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is necessarily embedded in some form of interconnected community, social and policy environments. And the trick with community interventions and thinking of systems, health services systems, but health systems as a whole, is to focus on making these environments enabling. So whether they are enabling or not will determine whether some, the experience of aging in place for an individual, for a family, uh, will be successful or not. So the premise, or my not my hypothesis, but one of core message here is that program that support aging in place. And here, whether we, a lot of people think, oh, but what do we do about dementia? And we can come back to this. It's not different. It's the same for the health of everybody. Um, is that the sh focus should really be on optimizing the fit between an individual and an environment. So it calls for a shift, a shift away from how do we treat people who are unwell. Or how do we treat chronic conditions to how do we design our health systems and our systems at community levels overall, both economic and social, so that the environment in which they live in is enabling? Now, this is a huge question and a challenge for practice. So many of, of you involved in developing policies is that the evidence base of what works for whom and under what circumstances is quite thin. So create it, and that creates some barriers for implementation and the scaling up of interventions. But despite the fact that the evidence is quite thin, there's a lot of knowledge and information accumulating uh, that we can build on. So the other key point I want to make, and, and some of the work I've done around age-friendly communities, and I'll come to how do we measure and build that evidence and demonstrate the value of investing in communities, I'll come to it, is that the premise of all, my whole research program over the last 10 years or so is that promoting healthy, engaged and active later life can work and add value at all stages of health and frailty. Because when we think of successful aging, there's not one cutoff point where you say, oh, I'm now successfully aging well or I'm not. There is a dynamic, so you might suddenly feel you are unhealthy because you find out you have diabetes, but if your diabetes is well controlled, if you have a way of controlling your physical activity, you have a good diet, the fact of having diabetes might not be that bad. You could still do what you want, engage in life, and do the things that are meaningful. So the, the, the aging, the successful notion of aging is dynamic one so we can work at different stages in life it doesn't have to be or you're healthy we can do something for you or you're not healthy and say well too bad there's nothing we can do so the evidence is accumulating and i can't go in any detail of what influence healthy aging and i've discussed i'll discuss some of that we have to develop interventions and 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 have tailored solutions to needs which is also obvious but the development of intervention doesn't come only from a research environment there's a lot of really innovative um natural experiments on rolling out policies rolling out pilot studies and localities that really inform what might work for whom and when and the tricky part, and this is where there's a lack of capacity and ability to do this, is demonstrating what, 
works and add value. And that's my business. That's what I'm trying to do, build capacity to demonstrate what works at scale. So it's a long life <laughs> mission. So the interventions, when we think about investing in community interventions, a lot of health systems, most health systems already do that. So we invest in individuals that live in communities. We invest in supporting um, uh, uh, commun uh, dyads or families, work with family um, in schools and things earlier in life. We can also do more work around the social environment, the work environment. People work longer and they should be able to work longer. And there are some spaces that allows people to work well if we address the barriers to engaging in these kinds of activities, whether it is in a big organization or running a, a, a library in a community. Um, and there's also activities at scale at, at city level. And a lot of my work is focused on, on city level stuff. So here it looks like a complex diagram, but it's just another way of bringing together the different determinants. And we've seen and we know, you know a lot about our health, the health sector has already shifted and reoriented, reoriented services towards health promotion, prevention of disease, provision of long-term care. A lot of this has been done at the individual level, and we have more evidence of what to do at the individual level. What needs to happen is to think more broadly, to tackle those environmental drivers of healthy aging, and look at the social relationship, the living conditions, the neighborhoods. And here there are aspects of natural environment that and, and, and dealing with cultural attitudes and stigma um, that, that where a lot of work is developing, but it's not necessarily clear for different health systems even and communities or regions, what do we invest in? And, and we need to work together really to say what is important, what are the outcomes at the community, but for older populations that we're really trying to achieve. We don't have a one size fits all answer to this, but there's a lot of work that's been done across the world on the outcomes that overall people tend to agree with. So if we have a consistent approach and we have a good understanding of what is it that we're trying to shift, when we focus on prevention, the focus is on keeping people healthy, pe keeping people engaged, active. And these call for a different conceptualization or even thinking about what it is that we measure to know what is it that we're trying to change in communities. So what we've done is just an example of what we can do is there's um, quite a lot of easily available evidence, so, so the scoping reviews, and we did some specific work around community-based intervention for mental health, um, because we don't know what happens in communities to support mental health. Just like physical health, mental health is critical for people to remain engaged, and uh, we wanted to know where are we in terms of our understanding of what works and what doesn't. And what we found with that systematic review is that Overall, it's difficult to pull the evidence together because there's very different approaches and different things are measured. So we don't have a consistent final message around what works on preventing mental ill health and promoting mental health in communities. But individual studies are quite rich sources of information to understand what might work. And here, it's, I know it's a very busy slide and the, the, the point is not to read it all, but just in, if you look at the intervention category column, what I'm trying to show you here is that there are different types of interventions. So what we found to support mental health and engagement, really, a lot of the interest here was to improve social connection and social engagement, the lead, um, reducing loneliness and social isolations and these very important um, drivers of, of, of successful aging. And we found we categorize them in, in different categories. So the first one is the connector interventions. So services and support systems that provide access and engage, they don't deliver um, smoking cessation or false prevention program, but they facilitate, they organize the environment to um, information structure to allow people to engage. There's what we call gateway interventions. And here with the examples, you can see it's the infrastructure, what allows, what facilitate in the built environment or the digital or the technological environment, community transport, so easily accessible buildings, uh, um, community taxis, 
um, supported by volunteers or by um, networks of uh, transport that allow people to move from one place to the other. There's also all these direct interventions that we can e more easily grasp, so the group base or individual interventions. And here there was specifically to support social connections because we were looking at mental health. There's quite a lot of uh, group and individual interventions that work on you know, facilitating or, or sports class or, or false prevention or active aging um, uh, activities. Here was specifically around creative and the cultural focus. And there's also the systems approach, which are quite complex. And I think some of you are quite interested in that. And, and one of the driver, and it links well with the age from the community, is the working together. So we had questions from the audience about what's the place of the you know social enterprise or the private sector. It is key because everybody in a particular community is an asset, you know, a cultural and economic asset for people to use and mobilize. And by working and understanding what, where, what is available in the community, you build on those local strengths to meet the needs in specific uh, environment. So switching now to the age-friendly community work, um, some of you may know the age-friendly community network. Um, but what it is really is a framework that helps us to understand how can we embed all these drivers of healthy aging in in in, active, in interventions at community or city level. So it's uh, driven by the WHO and it is um, an approach that facilitates and that ensure there's a better fit between the individual and the environment. And it creates and remove it, it's it's. They are created to remove physical and social barriers, but also, as I said earlier, different stage of health and illness to address the social determinants, to enable people to do the things they value. And the value part of it is quite important. It requires really understanding what do people want and then working with them to deliver this kind of structure environment that allows them to do what they want. So here's just very quickly, this is a picture I took uh, last week of the all the red dots represent age-friendly communities. And if we zoom in uh, parts of Asia or where there's some, you could see that there is a good example and some momentum on age-friendly communities. Um, and what it is here is that these are cities or communities that sign up to, being, to becoming age-friendly with WHO. What it doesn't show is all the innovation on the ground of other communities who are aiming to becoming age-friendly by their activities. They didn't sign up, but this is just a, a reference point to see there's a lot of structured activities. So what I was talking about earlier, say to build the evidence of what works in community, is that we did some discussion, we had some discussion with the UK network of age-friendly communities to say, why, how do we, how do we show a difference? How, and, and this is what the stakeholders have been telling us to say, we are asked from, for an accountability perspective from our funders and for, for our communities, what difference are we making? And the challenge is the evaluation, the ability to generate the evidence of of impact, really. So what we did, there was a two-year project summarized in one part of a slide, so we can talk about this and there are references for it. So we develop a tool and the, what we call domains on this slide are really the active ingredients of what is needed to build an age-friendly community um, initiative. Now, you could refer to the WHO framework, but when you think about how do we make people, what are the needs in the community to make them healthier and more engaged, these domains or these things are the active ingredients of what works. And what we did, and I won't go in any detail, we did quite a lot of field work with the city to develop the tool using the evidence, consultation with stakeholders and uh, older adults. And we also tested the, the tool to see is it flexible enough to cover the or the whole range of things that people want to uh, focus on. So we looked at falls, dementia-friendly communities, and we also looked at how do we redesign the community? How do we start with an aging well framework when we develop a new town or a new neighborhood? Um, these domains can be used for an evaluation, but they can also be used for planning. And that's why I'm showing it here with the regulatory um, perspective of, of, of your interest. I think many of these supports can be used as 
thinking tools, so these different domains, I mean, can be thinking tools to say, how do we make sure that what we design in community level actually has the greatest potential of having a difference? So as an evaluation tool, what we did is for each of these domains or input area, there's a simple way of collecting information of what's happening in a particular city around leadership, about the resources, the involvement of all the people. And this chart is really just a simple spider chart that generated from Excel. So it's not a sophisticated approach, but what it gives you, it identify in a very simple visual way, where are the, the weaknesses in the different uh, systems. So here it's an example of one particular city where they said they had great support for developing in age-friendly communities, but the interviews and the documentary evidence we found when we were looking into it showed that there's the governance is a problem. So there's a lot of coordination, but there's a gap in leadership. So people don't really have the, you know, the, the, the proposing power to do the kinds of things they want to do, despite having the resource and having involved people. So this is a, a tool, a mechanism to think through how we can organize these complex interventions in different communities. And here, my reason for presenting it is that I think it has potential for regulatory insights and it probably needs a bit of rethinking and reframing because it's focused as an evaluation tool. But I think there are transferable nuggets in there that might be quite interesting. We did the same for, <clears throat> excuse me, we did the same for dementia-friendly communities and I won't go in any detail. There's a big policy in the UK that pushed the development of, dem of dementia-friendly communities and we were uh, we were the lucky winner of, of, of a grant as a group. It was not led from Cambridge, it was led from a colleague in Hertfordshire, Dr. Claire Goodman, uh, where we said, how can we evaluate dementia-friendly community initiatives? There's something specific about dementia that is that we need to account for. And we came up with very similar uh, domains, so the environment. And we develop a suite of uh, resources and also this is all published in quite a lot of detail where we have the evaluation framework but one key thing coming to how do we demonstrate what works one aspect that we realized was not always in the in people's consciousness when they try to assess impact is the maturity of an intervention so where is the intervention is in, in its life cycle is critical when you think about what is it that you you want to change so thinking uh, an out completely different example if you implement a smoking cessation in teenagers this year you can't expect to see a decrease in mortality in two years from now. You will see the impact much later in life. So demonstrating the value in short, medium and long term of these investments needs to really frame the evaluation or the impact assessment. So deciding what do we want to look at um, according to that time frame of how this, the, 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 the intervention develops. Again, it looks obvious when we say it, but the break the barriers to the evaluation and where often evaluation break down is that we want to evaluate anything and the request is say, are we changing mortality? Are we decreasing care to the health system? So sometimes the time frame and the perspective of what it is that needs to be measured is misaligned with these questions. So this is something that emerged from our work and that this evaluation resource is trying to help address. The other thing, and we call this evolution. So the other thing here is around the outcomes. What does it mean for people affected by dementia? So again, with the ambition of demonstrating what is the value or what is the return on investment of some of these investments, well, you need to identify the outcomes. From a research environment, we often start with a protocol and you say, we're going to measure these three key things and we carry on. But when you look at long-term investment in these different types of intervention, what you have and what we find is a helpful tool and a framing to is to look at what is a theory, what we call a theory of change. And again, here, the point is not to go into any detail, but it's just if everybody involved in developing an intervention, a policy, a particular uh, intervention to roll out in a region or a community, you have to understand the context. Here it's for dementia-friendly community, but the principle applies. 
what you have to have you is, is what is it that you're trying to change? So it's a visual representation of what goes in a community and what do you expect will come out of it. And these are the building blocks of economic evaluations. What are the resources going in? What are the costs of an intervention? And what is it that we're trying to change in terms of outcomes? So if you look at the top, you'll see these are the same kind of headings of, of the evaluation tools. So the basis, what, why are we doing this? And why are we doing it? Who are the collaborations, to, um, the co collaborators who are already there? What resources need to be in? And then you frame the different types of outcomes. So for community-based interventions that are not focused only on health, there are a number of outcomes that a lot of people agree with. Again, we have information from different Asian countries, from the US, from Europe, the long list of outcomes that people prioritize. And if people agree of what it is that they're, you're trying to achieve with a particular intervention, whether it is about feeling engaged or whether ultimately it is about cost savings, which in many societies is what it is, how do you get there? And how do you track your, your, your impact along the way? And a theory of change like this can be changed on a regular basis. What This one is an example. As a starting point, you start with the long list and you prioritize and then you focus. So this is can, this can be resource in, uh, intensive, but if they're already consultations happening at scale in a particular community, which I think is happening with some of the new policies in, in Singapore, for example, some of these pointers of what we're trying to achieve can use as a good starting point, as opposed to having a blank slate. Now, I'm conscious of time. I'll go to now the more economic perspective of, of the valuing of all of this. Um, one core component to come up with a social value uh, or social return is to understand the resources going in. So, so um, here is just an example. And again, it's not to look in any detail, uh, just to focus on the different columns. So this is work we did in the context of the dementia friendly community national evaluations, where we had six study sites. So we mapped over 235 initiatives, narrowed down to 100 to do some deep dive into what are these different community, uh, dementia-friendly community look like? What drives them? Why are they there? Who are they for? Um, so that was like thick mapping that we call really description. And we also looked into what, what resources, what makes them work in community. And there are different models. So this is very typical of what happens in the UK. A lot of it was community-based and volunteer-led. In some places, it might be led differently, but the, the column of the flow or the source of the, the, the sustainability of these initiatives is really driven by the availability of these different types of funding. So whether it's charities, publicly funded, the private sector, um, a lot of staff. So if you have one coordinator that facilitates the development of, we'll say, dementia cafes or um, dementia friendly cinemas, um, sometimes that investment of one staff that, use, that is used as a connector can lead to a lot of um, value and benefits in community. But there's also all the other things that make things happen. Having access to the room, using the library at the weekends for the dementia cafes or using the print shop at the school that saves the community from having to pay for printing the right types of posters or the equipment. So all these resources are what drive and what allow a sustainable development of a community that is not only funded or supported by money coming from the public sector, but some of these communities are very much self-sustaining. And if you look at community C here, where I have the four cross in purple, they had a conscious, they made a conscious choice that they, it would be run by community. They will not raise grants, they will run it by themselves. So there are many different models and different contexts or in different countries. The value, the culture will often, and the current system might drive that. So the current work that we're doing, and I can't talk about it in a lot of detail, is that we realize there's a lot of information on process. So what is it that we can do? And how do we 
make sure we have the right people involved. But we don't know a lot about the benefits and the resource implications. So some of you in the audience ask us, so how do we measure social return on investment? Well, in a way, and this is this, this little nugget here on assessing value for money, it's, it, it is an accountability principle to really demonstrate the economic and the social efficiency or better allocation of resources uh, for the good of people. So at the moment, in many countries, including in, 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 in Singapore and many countries around the uh, reimbursement of drugs, for instance, there are different economic evaluation methods that are used to evaluate healthcare interventions. So you have the cost effectiveness, where you say you measure the impact or benefit in natural units. So the cost per hip fracture averted. There's a push also, and a lot of people have embraced this idea of cost utility, where you don't only measure natural units, so not just the health, but the quality of that health that the intervention push. And can't go in any detail, but some of you will be familiar with the quality. And there's also an approach of the cost benefit, where you, you, you measure outcomes, so these outcomes that you're wanting to achieve in monetary value. And a social return on investment is a practical approach to cost-benefit analysis, in a way. It involves a lot of stakeholders to get, a, to prioritize and agree on the types of outcomes. So coming back to that um, theory of change picture of what outcomes are we trying to achieve? What is a priority for the system involved in rolling out these community interventions? And then this is what you measure and this is what you value. So in the UK context, because the problem with rolling out social return on investment, and I'm almost, clo I'm, I'm almost uh, close to the end here, is that what are these social values? How do we get a monetary estimate for these benefits? Like what's the value of feeling connected to your community? So in, in the UK context, and I'll go quickly, I've put the references in, um, there's the Social Value Act and there was a requirement, so it is embedded in, in, in the regulatory system, that there's a requirement to evaluate the social value as part of the tender process for lar large outcomes, so for social care um, and, and local authorities. So there was a development of, of tools and a platform by, in part, the Social Value Portal with a list of social values, and they refer to these as the TOMs, so the national themes, that look at outcomes and measures. And it's a gold standard framework that localities can use to measure and report on, on social values or, or providers of services can use to demonstrate what is the value of the service they offer. And that's often and usually supplemented by other source. But we have in UK that kind of national reference that people can use and that allows it to be comparable. In many countries, this is not quite there yet or not there at all. So there's a barrier in, in actually doing it in practice, but the methods and the approach to doing it are available. There's, we need to improve the methods, but it is not there. And the TOMS, and when you think of social value, it embraces a much wider um, definition of benefits than what we would consider more traditionally in the healthcare system, where we looked at the qualities. And, and it allows the measurement of the of the benefits that grew from working locally and using local skills, so the employment, so the return on the economy. It also, if you use community assets to deliver social care, like we have a program looking at that, or, or community assets to develop, to, uh, to, to build social connection, they are environmental um, benefits from using the services and the assets in the community and so on and so forth for growth and social innovation. So there is a long list of outcomes. You say, what is the value of measuring the use of local skills? And they can people can use this to do some evaluation and monitor. So this is a resource um, that you could draw on from a development of regulation or systems perspective, there are examples and there's also uh, other ones. So when we do social return on investment, the question is, what are the environmental, social and economic impact? Or if I spend one dollar a Singapore dollar or a pound or, or, or euro is spent on delivering on the delivery of activity of services, can that same one dollar or pound be used to also produce the wider benefit of the community. And the social return on investment is a way of capturing that. It aims to capture that with prioritization across stakeholders who have a responsibility and a mandate 
and a mission to address and to impact on these benefits. I'll skip that one, but just to say we managed to do some scenarios and hypothetical scenarios of how that would work for people with dementia. So it is possible and we have done it. And now we're doing it for the whole age-friendly community um, network. And our prog program is finishing towards the end of December. So many of the outcomes are not available. Um, but what we did and what I can, I, I feel very confident in saying today with the background of the research we've done, is we looked at um, what is the evidence of the social return on investment of aging well interventions. So we started with age-friendly communities and we thought anything that has to do with working with whole communities and stakeholders to foster a healthy aging. And we didn't see any evidence of uh, findings that shows the benefit of the whole thing. So if we were to say, looking back at the, the theory of change where you have we prioritize three different interventions, let's say housing, transport, and social connectedness, and we identified key outcomes. Can we measure the impact of the whole package? At the moment, it's difficult to do, the tools are available to do it, but we don't have clear evidence um, of, of nobody's done it properly or, or at all at the moment. But we found, however, 23 studies, and here we focused on the English-speaking literature, and it was a scoping review. We, looked, we found 20, 23 uh, studies that focused on individual interventions. So if you look at the, this, the little picture in the corner, the multicolored box is the whole age-friendly communities. And what we found is evidence of, for one of these nuggets at the time. And the overall quality of evidence is, is pretty good. Um, and the scope for researchers to improve the the, the, the the, the, the data collection and the robustness is there. But overall, the message is that aging well interventions delivered in communities, including those targeting people with dementia from these 22 studies that we've found, does generate positive social return on investment. Now, work that I have seen as well recently, I didn't cite it, but I can add the, the, the reference to the reference list. There's a, a very recent review of the literature looking at mental health interventions delivered across settings, both higher income and lower income. And the core message is that there is a social return on investment. If you look at the public health literature more broadly, not just aging intervention, there is a social return on investment of investing in public health interventions at community levels as well. So I think the message is becoming clear if we pull everything together, despite limitations in individual studies, that there is a direction of travel that this seems to be benefiting society. So my final point here is the general regulatory consideration. I don't know if they are regulatory, but they are design consideration when you think about investing and developing community-based interventions to foster active aging or successful aging, whatever the definition, is that it has to be aligned with community demographics. And it's obvious. So we do this when we decide how we're going to invest and reimburse this new drug. We understand what the health needs of the population is. It's the same thing for community-based interventions. So the context, the needs and the preference. And the really critical thing is who is likely to benefit? Who is most likely to benefit? And I'll come to the equity question on the next slide. The other principle that seems to be working is to have is that there's a, a move and a shift towards promoting better integrated health systems. So those core principles and integrated health system is one of the core, one of the four priority area of the new decade of aging, which links to the sustainable development goal, but also tries to address environmental and equity issues in the delivery of health at scale. Um, the principle of working together and improving the comprehensive support and efficiency and equity is quite important. The age-friendly community model is a model that embeds these principles by design, uh, but other models have also uh, supported that. And the logic of social return on investment, which asks for stakeholders to confirm and work together to assign and to prioritize is also embedding there. So, so there are platforms and, and good frameworks to think about this in a creative way. 
the engagement is also quite important to ensure the sustainability of it. And I've given some example with the dementia-friendly community, resources, what goes into um, building these communities. It's often the local assets and knowing what assets are available is um, a driver of sustainability of these interventions, not just environmental, but time in a time. So the last key things, and of course, this is this is what I do, so I'll push, I'll push for that. We need to have a robust system for data collection and analysis, because there will never be enough researchers to assess everything we need to assess. And there needs to be some kind of reactivity in community level to say, are we doing the right thing and have the flexibility and the reactivity to shift quickly if something's not working. It can only be done if there's a system of data collection to monitor what's happening. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but thinking about it and monitoring on a regular basis can deliver evidence and it builds evidence for everybody else and case examples to then transfer and scale up the things that seems to be working. And the final point really is equity, is avoid generating inequalities by design. And, and, and here from a regulatory perspective, I think there's really serious thinking in, around the accessibility, the affordability barriers and the incentives. So basically one core one is to make sure community support services that we've discussed today, if this is something that some of you might want to do, is that the access is on the basis of needs and not on the basis of ability to pay. And sometimes if you start from a current environment and say a legal or re regulatory environment and say, say, we'll extend it or we'll push it to this new thing we want to do in communities, um, sometimes these can be generating inequalities just because by default. So if if you have access to um, welfare benefits and you need to be on welfare benefits to be able to engage in a specific, I don't know, physical activity intervention in a community. Well, everybody who don't were not on welfare benefit, but would benefit from the activity are not able to engage. So there are a number of barriers that are kind of hidden sometimes when we just try and replicate or transfer some of these um, regulatory systems to different modules that are complex. So it's just thinking those through clearly and consider a uh, careful consideration of technology at the interface, because although it is a positive for the system sometimes, it's not easily accessible. So the key messages, I've said that before, so the program that support aging will need to optimize the fit between individual environment and there's evidence accruing that there is a return for this. That monitoring and evaluation is going to be what allows us to monitor progress and to build on innovations that make a difference at the social scale. And also that promoting healthy engaged aging is possible across different health and frailty. So prevention approach for those who don't have any illnesses or conditions, but also enabling systems for people who are progressing towards disability, but still have a lot of potential and an interest and, and value in, in engaging in the environment in which they live. So I have a nice long list of references and I'll just thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Louise. That was such a rich, inspiring talk, uh, not only in terms of the research you've done, but the insights that you shared. And I was very encouraged by your opening statement on the fact that uh, home does not exist in a vacuum and we need to embed it in an interconnected community. Uh, we don't really have much time for questions. We have one question in the Q&A, but I wanted to ask you, um, based on your research, because in the Singapore context and across Southeast Asia, uh, we face quite a diversity of cultural issues. Um, have these aspects been picked up in your research? Because I know the UK has quite a diverse population these days. So is there any uh, sort of cultural implication one must look at when you look at uh, aging in the community? Are there differences in approach and does it affect policies? Um, well, I, I think the answer, the answer is yes. So in the research environment and also in a lot of activities that are being led by governments, local authorities, different stakeholders, is the diversity in the community is often difficult to, to capture. 
So we know there is diversity in the community. The people who tend to engage with these conversations, whether they engage in research or consultation by public, tend to be the people who have a specific interest, who are either, in many cases, either more educated, who have a language that they're comfortable um, talking, who don't have the limitations. So for older adults who have mobility or uh, sensory limitations, if you say we have a great stakeholder event at that particular venue and there's nothing to facilitate their ability to come out of the house and actually join. So the idea of having a, a diverse engagement to understand what the cultural needs is, is very much at the forefront of our research and there are tools to help us do this properly. The challenge is that there are still a lot of what we call under-researched. So we don't want to say the people who are hard to reach. It's not they're hard to reach. They're not the one that are hard to reach. It's us who don't necessarily use or mobilize the right tool to engage them. So there are big challenges in engaging the groups that often, and including in social in, in low social you know, economic environments or people in difficult conditions, um, the, the ability to benefit from a lot of these community investment is that where the most value would accrue is often in these groups. And they tend to be in the ones that don't necessarily tell us what they need. So, so I think a lot of effort needs to do there, but there are good papers and good approaches to break those barriers that we have as researchers or when we organize to, to address that and, and uh, I can share a few tools. One, one particular tool um, is, is, has been developed by different groups from different cultural backgrounds as well. So, Thank you very much. I'd better go to the questions that are in the Q&A uh, uh, chat. And um, firstly, uh, 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 Jessalyn Chan thanks you for the wonderful sharing. And she wonders, what are your thoughts on the feasibility of adapting the gated dementia village model of care, which we have in Singapore, where residents can freely access common amenities in the community in a safe way with dignity? Mm -hmm. I suppose this is in the context of moving it from just a village model to a wider community setting. Your yeah. thoughts, please? Well, I think um, the main, from a, an, an evidence point of view, the main reason why you would want to shift or, or the main rationale for moving it is that you know it has benefit, right? So you have to see, it, and in order to shift it, so, so first you have to demonstrate that it has value in some, in some form, and I assume you probably have that, either documented or not. What I think is critical to move it to scale is to consider what is the model itself? So what are the boundaries of this intervention, this thing that you've done? And what part of it is dependent on the community in which it is embedded? Because if you have a drug, for instance, it's antibiotic, five days a week, you give it, people take it or take it not. The reason why that model work in that particular community is because there's something about the system and the context in that community and who and the people who engage with that particular model in any way, shape or form. There's something about that that makes the active ingredients work. So you have to be clear on what these are. And when you want to bring it to somewhere else, have a simple, I think there are simple ways to say, it. oh, do we have... Did we look at all these things and what needs to be shifted? It might be that there is there are assets in that particular community that are not available in another community. And, and in the UK and many places, I'm not sure it's the same issue in, in Singapore, but I'm sure it is in other Asian country. There's a difference if a model is 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 in a very is in a city and you're trying to develop it for a more rural area or suburb area then the assets and the ability for this model to work are very different. So, so understanding that context, and, and if, if it is to roll out in many different communities, probably have a systematic, very simple table of what are the key things that drive the success? Is it available in other places? And if not, what can we change or what needs to change in this model for the benefits to recruit in that new community? 
So it can be done at scale with the structure, uh, I think. It needs thinking, obviously, but uh, I think it is possible. Thank you. Uh, we have one other question uh, from Vanessa Coe, and she thanks you again for the talk. Two questions. Uh, the first one touching on equity. Would understanding the social value of investment allow us to see the issues and consequences of not allocating resources fairly? And the second question is, what should we be taking note of uh, when developing and or implementing? Oh, the question disappeared now. <laughs> uh, what should we be taking note when developing and or implementing community-based interventions where we are not just looking specifically on clinical issues like falls or cognition, but one that fosters a whole host of healthy behaviors? Mm. Well, for the first one, for the question of equity, so I, I think any, well, <laughs> maybe it's ideal, but any, any model should consider equity from the outset. Um, and some, and, and we know that a lot of models will generate, we call intervention generated inequalities. So it's designed in a way that excludes and, and that um, exacerbate inequalities. So, so thinking ahead. Now, I think the question was about how do we, in, what is the social value of investing in something that are equitable versus not equitable? I'm not sure I yeah. got the beginning of the question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think one way of looking at it is to see uh, using other experimental or natural natural rollout of, of interventions. As you can see in different, let's say in, in your country, where investment has been made and where maybe investments or types of models have not been made and, and see what are the equity, because we have to identify the, when we talk about inequalities or equity, it can be, I mean, I didn't unpack that, but it's a huge definition. When we talk about inequities, what are we talking about? Is it inequity in access? Is it that we're concerned with inequalities in health outcomes across different subgroups of the population? Is it inequality in ability to engage so that people can benefit? So again, just like the outcomes, it needs to be unpacked. So what dimension? Ultimately, we want everybody, I mean, ultimately, we want everybody to stay happy forever. But the reality is there will be disparities in health status. What we need to understand is, is what part of these inequalities is unfair? What, what part of it can we address by doing things in a more equitable way and and when we think about these problems it's not looking at social economic uh, social economic status gender um religion um education all in silos but there's the, that concept of intersectionality which is a lot of these factors that lead to health inequalities or de-engagement or or people not benefit they all intersect in the same way as the environmental factors i mentioned they intersect. So if you just say, oh, we do, we're focusing this only on age, but there's a major a cultural issue that is linked to gender, then there's a problem. So, so understanding where equity or inequality are generated by intervention needs to take that intersectional lens. And again, they are sim not simple, but they're really nice conceptual and even visual representation, just so that you can keep these balls in, in, in your head when you design, because it is not easy to, you know, put it in a nice, simple spreadsheet. Mm. So. I don't know whether you have time for the second one, which is uh, basically, I think the question was rather than looking just at specific issues like falls or cognition, how mm. do you develop or implement community-based interventions that foster a whole host of healthy yeah. behaviors? Well, I think uh, many of the things, so, so if you, so, the healthy behaviors could be around the ability to engage food systems, um, environment that foster physical activity. You know, I'm thinking of these three ones. So if you work at the environmental level, if you control, if you find different ways of modifying the environment and the core outcomes of interest is not are we changing obesity rates or are we decreasing lung cancer by smoking cessation practices? But I was saying, are the ability for people to engage in healthy behaviors in this community actually promoting these healthy behaviors? So the outcome of interest is this 
ability to do, ability to change behaviors, and you choose the type of outcome. So the in, in terms of favoring community cohesion, just just building social capital in a particular community will facilitate the engagement in healthy behaviors because it will eliminate some of these barriers. So you could use these outcomes as opposed to those health outcomes and say they are measures of social cohesion, measurement of social capital, um, it's thresholds and, and scales to measure from the people's perspective, different view, how their sense of belonging to a community and engaging with community has changed. And these are sensitive to change. And in the UK, I've talked about the social value bank. We do have proxies of what is a change in these measures valued at. How much value? I mean, it is a priority, in, but how much value do we attribute to these kinds of change? So these are not transferable. These are UK-based values. And having those kinds of values, just like we have qualities, we have reference utility measures to assess different drugs and have the quality as a common denominator to compare the social values, the metric that we could use as a common denominator across different intervention needs to be kind of country specific, you know, cultural specific at least. And if you have that list, that's what I referred to in confusion, like a social value bank in the same way as we have utility and cost utility kind of reference point to translate quality of life in a quality. So, so that shift that we do with drugs all the time, that tool would allow you to measure across different interventions. If there's an incremental benefit of investing in individual physical activity intervention or a combination of many of the other things that people need to do to actually feel like Engaging in healthy behaviors is not just the right thing to do, but it is a thing that people enjoy, and this sh it shouldn't be in any other way. Um, so, so, but I don't think as systems in the research we have some in the research environment we have some of the tools. It's not quite ready for transfer implementation, but part of this is because I think as researchers, and I'm talking from my perspective, we need to allow ourselves to really engage and understand what these needs might be from a system so that the tools are moved over. That's what I do. I'm not all, I mean, some people, obviously a lot of other people do it, but this ability to transfer, and the same as we have a, an intervention that works in a clinical trial, but then it stays at the pilot phase because we can never implement it. If we develop a trial that is implementable in the first place, the same applies to these kinds of topics, I think. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Louise. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, as we said before the webinar started, we should keep in touch and see whether we can pursue other collaborations. But I want to thank you very much for your time and for your sharing. I think we've all learned a great deal. I was particularly encouraged by that point you made, which is also your last point, that no matter where we are in our stages of health and fragility, if efforts are well targeted and del delivered equitably, uh, we still can have good outcomes and results. So I think that's very helpful, no matter what stage we are in terms of our community-based policies for aging. So with that, a very a thank you very much, uh, Louise, and thank you very much to the audience as well for your participation. And we look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, so, thank you very uh, much that, for the we, opportunity. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, I will end the webinar.